Hi, Joe. Hi, Sam. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Um, just to say that this is just over a week before our conference starts, and it's great to have you in Scotland just by chance, and that we can have a chat about the topic that you are interested in and that many of our audience would not know very much about, who may have heard about it, but I think what we'd like to try and do is tell them a little bit more about something called the inheritance of Abraham. Sure. Um, so let me first of all welcome you to Scotland um, and maybe you can tell me just a little bit about what the inheritance of Abraham is about. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for the welcome to Scotland. It's been uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful so far. So the, uh, the inheritance of Abraham is a document that has been adopted by the Church of Scotland, uh, which in summary is an affirmation of what is often referred to as replacement theology. Uh, it's also referred to variously as supersessionism. Uh, sometimes you'll hear terms such as fulfillment theology or uh, inclusion theology. But in essence, what uh, replacement theology or supersessionism is, is the idea that with the events of 70 AD, of course, after the crucifixion of Jesus, that the events of 70 AD uh, represent a permanent rejection of Israel uh, from God's ongoing calling and election and purposes that essentially with the destruction of Jerusalem and then the, over the next hundred years, the, the dissolving uh, of that nation and the exile, that this was a permanent disavowal. It was a divorce mm -hmm. and that God was, uh, it was his will that Israel would essentially be dissolved as a people, dissolved as a family. And so that is uh, sort of a summary uh, of replacement theology and that in place of the Jewish people, that God has then opened up the doors to all of the Gentiles. And so thus the church, the Christian, uh, the global Christian body represents the new Israel, the metaphorical Israel, the spiritual Israel, the new and true Israel. And so unfortunately, this is a system of belief, a theology that has has been embraced by the majority of the church down through history. Uh, and it was not until the mid 19th century uh, in the, the aftermath or the outflow of the Protestant Reformation that a movement sprouted up out of Ireland uh, called the Plymouth Brethren Movement, which resulted in a return to what's often referred to as a more literal hermeneutic, which is to simply to say to read the biblical prophets uh, with a bit more of a face value approach. It doesn't mean a rigid, hyper-literal approach, but simply to take them at face value, which has caused much of the church, a, a large percentage of the global church, to say, no, this whole notion of replacement theology, it's thoroughly unbiblical. This is not what the Bible teaches. It's clearly not what the prophets teach. It's not what Jesus or the apostles or the New Testament teaches, uh, but rather the events of 70 AD represent a temporary covenantal chastisement of Israel mm -hmm. according to the, uh, the Mosaic covenant, but that the Abrahamic covenant, the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to the descendants of, of Israel, that that was everlasting. And so in the same way that the events with uh, the dispersion of Israel under the Babylonian exile represented a temporary chastisement, so also were the events of 70 AD uh, a temporary chastisement. But according to God's purposes, his promises to Abraham are everlasting, and he would, uh, after a period of time, restore Israel. And so in no way does the church replace or supersede Israel. Rather, the church is... Uh, the extension of Israel's call to be a blessing to all the Gentiles, to all the nations, to be a light to the Gentiles. And if we understand the unfolding of God's purposes properly, then the Gentiles being brought in is part of that project. It's not uh, God's plan B. It's not a replacement, if you will. And, and what do you think, Joel, that it's been so um, taken up so much by the Church of Scotland? What, yeah. What's the Church of Scotland? Why is it different? To what other churches might be doing? Well, unfortunately, there are, are many um, more mainstream denominations that are tending to 
uh, embrace replacement theology. Because one thing I did mention is after the Plymouth Brethren movement, uh, we've reached the point now where uh, the majority of the church globally rejects replacement theology. In fact, I'd, I'd say it's about two thirds of global Christendom rejects replacement theology, re- rejects supersessionism. Um, but as is typical uh, with every season, there's a new cycle of uh, reactionary theology that develops. And so one of the um, issues that has gripped much of the world, and, and we won't get into all of the underlying reasons with various lobbying groups in the UN and so forth, but it's very common, it's very popular to have a passion for justice for the Palestinian people. And so I think some of the, um, some of that particular trend is underlying the move to embrace theological replacement theology, which again sort of casts Israel as a bit of the juggernaut oppressive occupying force and the Palestinian is placed within this narrative as the underdog, the, the David, if you will, in the larger conflict against Goliath. So, one, because people are uh, emphasizing justice, and we affirm, of course, that that's a good thing. We believe God's heart beats with justice for everyone. Um, unfortunately, they have, in, in order to justify their sort of anti-Israel political stance, they've affirmed and, and embraced uh, a document which affirms a theology which is incredibly controversial within the church globally. And so they've, they've affirmed a theology, which not only is it incredibly divisive within Christianity, but it also arguably has been responsible for the long historical mistreatment of the Jewish community by Christians, not just in attitude, but in deeds. And of course, I've written a bit on this in terms of the clear the clear result of replacement theology and how that results in the mistreatment of the Jewish people. And so in my personal opinion, it's a tremendously grievous thing that the church of Scotland has embraced this document, which affirms a theology, which is one divisive within the church, which too arguably contributes to anti-Semitism and, and poor relations clearly between the Jewish community and the Christian community uh, and and all of this is especially grievous in light of the present rise, once again, of global anti-Semitism. And so in my opinion, this is uh, a document, it's an issue that needs to be challenged robustly uh, by Christians within the Church of Scotland. Uh, but I think it's also valid to say that the, the Jewish community in Scotland uh, should also participate in challenging uh, the, the, the embrace of this document and, and actually ask the church to potentially rescind and reject this document. So we as Glasgow Friends of Israel, we recognize that there is in Scotland quite a strong pro-Palestinian movement. And one of the reasons we've, we've been going to the street on a regular basis, and I must say not just Jewish people, but Glasgow Friends of Israel is unique in the fact that it's got membership of both Christian and Jews, and we stand together in the middle of Glasgow every week to talk to, to Scottish people about the, the Palestinian, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and we're trying to do what we can to try and redress the balance. Right. But what do you think um, should and could be done on a broader scale with regards to um, discussing with the Church of Scotland how this is affecting uh, the Jewish community in Scotland? Well, again, I think it's important uh, for the Church of Scotland and for those who are responsible for these sort of things to recognize that uh, the Jewish community here in Scotland, as well as the Jewish community in Israel, uh, agrees with and affirms this issue of the need for justice for the Palestinian people. The problem is, is that we're dealing with an incredibly complicated geopolitical conflict that has been ongoing. And the embrace of replacement theology, and the embrace quite frequently of very strongly anti-Israel, we'll say anti-Zionist uh, positions, this is a, an extreme position to be taking. Rather than acknowledging the incredibly complicated situation that we have in the Middle, of e- in the Middle East, of course, this is the issue that uh, everyone from outside of Israel loves to have incredible opinions about. Rather than taking 
uh, a cautious stance. They've embraced a fairly radical position. Mm -hmm. They've embraced a fairly inflammatory, arguably uh, clearly anti-Zionist, but arguably anti-Semitic position. And so I think it's important for the Jewish community to say, listen, we affirm your passion for justice, um, but perhaps we could take a bit more of a cautious approach and agree that we all, we all want to see a, uh, an equitable, just solution to the conflict in the Middle East, but we can do so without demonizing uh, one side or the other. And in this case, Israel is the party that's being demonized. And, and this is really our position in Glasgow Friends of Israel. We believe that you have to support both people, unlike the other side, which is very supportive of Palestinians, but is demonizing Israel on a regular basis. And this is very timely because it's just been announced that there's going to be an initiative between the Jewish community in Scotland and the Church of Scotland. They're going to get together to try and discuss the the misunderstandings, I suppose, mm -hmm. that have arisen because of this of this topic. Right. Um, and from that point of view, it's very. <clears throat> We've, I'm very, very optimistic that this situation in Scotland could be improved between the Jewish community and the Church of Scotland. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're here right now at a moment in history where the Shoah is roughly 70 years behind us. This was, this was yesterday. I mean, in the big picture, this was just yesterday. And I'm often thinking of the fact that before the Holocaust, there was, there was anti-Semitic rhetoric that was coming out of Germany. But by and large, the anti-Semitism that was expressed was largely expressed behind closed doors. But we are right now at a moment in history when there is more overt anti-Semitic rhetoric. I mean, coming from multiple nations, multiple people groups, including many uh, even non-religious secular groups all across Europe, to where the anti-Semitic rhetoric today is 10,000 times worse than it was before. The Holocaust, and so we need to acknowledge the moment that we're standing in. And clearly, I believe that um, the Church of Scotland would like to see healthy, godly uh, relationship with the Jewish community in Scotland. And I don't think it's at all. I, I think it's entirely reasonable. Uh, in fact, I would stand shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish community to say to the Church of Scotland: in order for us to have healthy relationship. The, uh, the document, the inheritance of Abraham, needs to be rejected. It, it, because uh, it's, it, I would say, ar it's arguable, but I would say it's demonstrable mm -hmm. that this type of language leads to not just poor relationships, but abuse, mistreatment, and hatred. And to say, how can we come together and have positive relationships while affirming all the things that we agree on? Again, justice for the Palestinians' um, wise approach to this incredibly complicated situation. And, and um, I think that we begin with the assumption, and I think it's good to begin with the assumption that the Church of Scotland does want good relationship, does want a good relationship with the Jewish community, um, but to be uncompromising in the fact that this is an issue that is, we're not willing to budge on. Well, let's hope this gives us a much more optimistic future. And thank you very much, Joel, for spending time with us today. All right. Thank you so much, Sammy. God bless you. Okay.